apologize for the technical gremlins that appear to have been attacking our system each and every time we try and say hello to you all at the start of our drive. My name is Jamie and I have Jandre on camera with me and we are coming to you live from Juma, Arethusa and Cheetah Plains game reserve in the Sabi Sand in the Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. And not only are we live but we're also interactive which means that you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv uh, We've come racing through in this direction on this chilly, cloudy, wintry morning here in the African bush to follow up on a report that the monkeys were alarm calling at something in this area. Now this is a report that came through to me from one of the other guides on our Game Drive channel. Uh, I've stopped here and I haven't heard anything. It's all very, very quiet around a road that we call Ingwe Ali, uh, the road where the leopards move about on, essentially. It's so called Ingwe Ali because this is where all the leopards were. And we're going to try and figure out exactly what is happening here because, of course, yesterday we were, if not hot on the trail of Karula, then certainly warm on the trail of Karula. The Queen of Juma, the female leopard that spends most of her time in this area, with her two five and a half month old cubs. Uh, yesterday when I went to try and find her, the area was uh, packed with elephants, which of course makes tracking somewhat tricky. And then we had to rush across for Arethusa for a very special afternoon spent with Salayeshe and Tiani, her daughter. First time I think Tiani has ever been on the live safari, so a very, very exciting sunset safari that we had yesterday. And then lions roaring from Buffelshook, where there is a, an elephant that has died of natural causes. But unfortunately what that means is once our lions discover it, I think they're going to settle down for a feast that will last at least three days, probably a week or more. As you can imagine, an, a, a dead elephant, even for lots and lots of hungry lions, provides a buffet-style meal for a considerable period of time. Okay, well, since we are true to form, there's a water buck over there, but it's very far away, so we're just going to show you briefly. Oh, and it's just its bottom right now. A, a e male water buck with its dark fur, just all puffed up and chilly first thing in the morning. Since our water buck is wandering away from us and presenting us with a rear view, combined with the fact that I'm sure you are all very, very excited to hear about somebody else's travels, I am going to send you over to Brent, who cannot hold off telling you his wonder about his wonderful adventures any longer. Oh. And isn't that a glorious horizon to the east? Welcome to the Sunrise Safari here on Safari Live. And of course, for those of you who know, my name is Brent and I'm back from Rwanda. It was a bit of a, really a sort of fly-by-night trip. We're only there for two nights. It was absolutely incredible. Fascinating country. And I'm sure you guys got lots of questions. And remember, questions, use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or email me questions at wildearth.tv. So we are looking for Queen Karula. Um, that is the dominant female leopard in this area. And uh, we haven't found any tracks yet, but I'm hopeful she and the two little darlings will come and give us a nice hello or welcome back. So we're checking around at Treehouse Dam at the moment. And uh, it is uh, not too cold this morning and I'm quite thankful for that. It's about 14 degrees Celsius, 54 Fahrenheit. So a pleasant morning out, and as you saw, an absolutely spectacular sunrise uh, to the east. And uh, the clouds seem to be breaking up, and I'm quite happy about that. And uh, not too much wind, a slight breeze, and uh, it's good to be back in the bush. And from a very green country, where I was, was it yesterday? No, the day before, um, to a very dry country now. So on average, in this part of the world, we get about 400 mils of rain a year. Uh, for example, where we were in the Volcanoes National Park, get 1,600 mils of rain a year. So a very, very different environment. Oh, game drive radio. All 
Alright, there we go. So, tracks of a young male leopard, probably naughty little Cinderlai, um, heading west up Gallagher Shortcut. So, we're going to check this area, and if we get no tracks here, we're going to go see if we can help or re follow up on those tracks. And it is an absolutely stunning morning, as I said, and I'm so happy to be back in the bush. And I, I think I did something in the last week not many people can ever say they've done. So I went from leopards fighting in a tree on Wednesday morning. Uh, by Thursday evening, I was on the edge of the Volcanoes National Park. And on Friday, um, I was at over 3,000 meters uh, looking at gorillas in alpine moorland. Now, full of bracken stinging nettles that was actually one of the big surprises so they tell you to wear long pants and i'm not a big fan of long pants especially if the weather's warm and it was but if you don't wear long pants you will literally be completely taken apart by all the stinging nettles and uh, and the wild celery which is one of the gorilla's favorite foods i will be posting some pictures shortly uh, i think this evening i will post a, a gorilla picture we did have some incredible sightings while I was there. I don't want to give too much away because there is a video of what we saw coming. But I can tell you we went to the Sousa group and the Sousa group is the group for the fit people. And, oh, let me just turn this down. Oh, did you see that, Dave? And I forgot to say, Dad? I have Dangerous Dave, right the objectified dish on my camera with me today. Um, you got it, Dev? Nope. Okay, uh, down in that, f uh, come out of it. Hey, you see a little bit to the left? You see a little movement there? Center frame? Zoom up a bit. Up, 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 up. Okay, just stay there. There's a, you'll wait for the movement. So down to the right slightly. A little bit more. There we go, you see the movement. There we go. Now, let's see who's awake. And let's start with a bird quiz. And, uh, well, when we actually get a sight of the bird, there it is, hopping around in the little fallen down thorn tree. So if we get a sight of the bird, I, I want you guys to tell me what bird this is. And if you know what bird it is, send your answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or use the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter when it finally decides to show itself. And it's a nice little LBJ, a little brown job to get the gray matter working the sunrise safari oh dear. yeah that was my oh I don't even know what that is oh there, that was my alarm from Rwanda that's why it's going off <laughs> sorry about that I do apologize yeah, Dave's got the bird, and Joey's wondering if I saw any new cool birds in Rwanda. I did. I saw about, I would guess, about seven or eight new species. Unfortunately, as I said, it was a very much a quick trip. I didn't have much time to bird. Um, I got some beautiful new sunbird species. I got the Rizuri double-collared sunbird, as well as coppery sunbird and violet-backed sunbird. Um, and those were all in our hotel garden. We didn't actually have much time to do much else. And there we go. Dave's still following the LBJ quite nicely. And I'm sure our serious birders already know what that is. And we're going to leave the LBJ and keep looking for sign of Queen Karula. So while we keep looking for a leopard and you guys think about what bird that possibly might have been, uh, let's go back to Jamie, who has a gorgeous vista to show you. While you have a think about what a bird it is that Brent is trying to get you to guess, we do indeed have a lovely vista playing out in front of us. The sun slowly attempting to struggle its way over the clouds and giving us a beautiful view. Very picturesque. And we've been... Not really, it's actually not been as bad a cold front as I was expecting. It was so warm over the last few days that I was really expecting to have a brutal cold snap. It really hasn't been that bad. 
yet. Makes me a little bit nervous about the weather that we're experiencing. We're in the middle of winter. It should be utterly freezing, and yet here we sit, not shivering at all, first thing in the morning. And bear with me one second. Brent is trying to call me on the game drive comms, and let me just hear what he wants me to do. Oh, never mind. Too late. I missed my chance. <laughs> There's the lion calling. Far away. The lion calling. I'm trying to listen exactly where it's calling from. I think it's outside of our traverse area. It's difficult to tell with my earpiece in, but I suspect it's around the Buffelshook Cheetah cut line boundary. So I think I'm going to go follow up. I mean, this is a beautiful view, don't get me wrong, but there are things to find on this winter's morning, and we can't dilly-dally looking, looking at sunrises the whole time. Let's go and see if we can't find some lions, especially since that female with the young cubs will probably have returned back to that den site in order to feed them. And depending upon whether or not they've discovered that elephant, she may well then decide to move them a little bit closer, which is definitely not something we want to miss out on. I'm still waiting for my chance, by the way, to respond to Brent. I'll just wait a little bit patiently. Still a conversation. Nope, still not. Oh well, we tried. It was very optimistic, but now Brent is having the conversation. Nearly there. I'm sorry. <laughs> There's lots happening this morning. It sounds as though they've just found a leopard to the north of our boundary in Buffles Hook. So the property to the north of where we are but potentially coming south. I don't know whether it's a male or female just yet. I'm going to find out now. Our oh, Brent's standing by. I didn't either. It was an update um, and I didn't hear anything further. Went and sat around Ingwe Alley. Didn't hear anything. I think I'm going to take Gallagher shortcut and then go east from there. Cool, now that we've made all of our arrangements as to where we go, something I want to do quickly with all of you on board, which is go to the old hyena den, because there are tracks up and down Gallagher shortcut once again. Doesn't look like the whole clan before we all get our hopes up that they have returned to Juma. They moved, they all sort of packed up their stuff and shipped off to Manuleti, which is north north of Buffelshoek and we think it was prompted by the presence of the Nkuhumas pretty much constantly on Juma. We think that that actually pushed them and their cubs a little bit to the north. However, there is still one female, the one called Gwen, with her two new cubs and I suspect because of her ranking within the clan, I suspect that she's staying away from the rest of the youngsters or keeping her babies away from the rest of the youngsters. So she's quite low ranking, which means that while her cubs are young and vulnerable, she can't fight for them. If she sees them getting bullied or chewed on by the other hyena cubs, the older hyena cubs, there's nothing she can do to rectify that situation because she runs the risk of finding herself incurring the wrath of the higher ranking females. Now, I'm still hoping that she might be around here and since we're on Gallagher shortcut, I figure we might as well give it a go. Let's go and investigate. I'm moving relatively quickly through this area because Taxon's already driven along this road. So I know that with his expert tracker fan, he would not have missed anything that might be moving along here. And he, he really just drove along here. 
I don't need to worry about something walking on top of his tracks. Speaking about early morning sounds, of course, one of our favorites is the sound of the ground hornbill calling first thing in the morning. And AJ Mirabel is just wondering when last we saw a ground hornbill. And you're right, AJ Mir Mirabel. It has been, it's been a long time since we last saw a ground hornbill. I'm trying to think when we last saw one. I think the last one I saw was on Cheetah Plains, the three of them on Cheetah Plains. That was ages ago. Sure, very good point. I, d I can't think of any other sighting since I came back to work three and a half weeks ago. Hmm, very good point. Now they do, the one thing about the ground hornbill is that this time of year they actually don't call as frequently as they do in their breeding season. They tend to they tend to go quite quiet and they only really start calling in October once again. But perhaps that's why. Perhaps they've been around and we just haven't realized because they haven't been calling to alert us to their position. And woe is me. Sadness and heartbreak. The hyena den is very quiet. How terribly, terribly sad. does give us a nice opportunity to just sit and listen. And if we have a look at the bird on the top of the buffalo thorn, let's just have a close look. I think we've got a scimitar bull there. Hold on a minute. How lovely. A nice one. Oh, I should have actually added to Brent's bird quiz there and asked you about that. And it's giving an interesting call. Usually scimitar bills have a high-pitched whistling song. But this one is just giving off a chirping call. So, whilst the hyena den might not be occupied, it has provided us with a really really nice bird to tick off our list. Scimitar. Scimitar like the, the farming tool. Um, S-C-I-M-T-A-R. No, sorry. S-C-I-M-I-T-A-R. Scimitar. Scimitar bull. Okay, let's, obviously we don't ask Jamie to spell things first thing on a Monday morning. That's what we've learned from that. But a really, really nice one, one we don't often get to get on camera. Oh, and we've got another view of the sunrise accidentally beautiful <laughs> and welcome to Francis who has asked me a question that sort of makes me quite sad not because of course of Francis's question but just because Francis wants to know if we ever see any spotted hyena Francis we used to see them pretty much every single day they were either at this den site or the one a hundred or so yards away. And then, well, there's a couple of other den sites that they used to use. We got to know them, I would say, I wouldn't say, well, I'd say we got to know them pretty much as well as any guide knows the different hyenas of the area. We got to know the intricacies of their clan dynamics, and we still do. Unfortunately, our clan has moved their den site a little bit outside of our traverse area. We don't even get them calling anymore around camp, which we used to all the time. But never fear, because at some point they will be back. I saw a hyena yesterday, actually, with the leopard killed. It was such an awesome sighting. Hyena sitting down in a, in a sort of a river system in the sandy bed, waiting, looking up at the two leopards that were snacking on an inyala above them, waiting for the scraps to come tumbling to the floor that it could hoover up as it was wandering up and down. So yes, we see spotted hyena. Did we used to see them more often? Yes. 
Um, and I'm quite devastated because my happy place was to come and sit at a hyena den and just watch their dynamics. We used to, we would have hyena cubs coming right up to the vehicle and sniffing the vehicle, occasionally getting a little bit too adventurous and trying to nibble on the tires because hyenas are clever and curious and they like to learn in that way. Sorry, Mike's just chatting about some lion tracks that he's found coming in to Juma. That's very interesting. I know Brent is around that area, so we're going to keep an ear out and just listen for follow. Uh, there we go, Brent's on it. Brent's on it, never fear. Brent is back. Brent the cat master. So Francis, we do see a spotted hyena. They have devastated us <laughs> by moving away. I'm very, very sad about this. But you never know. And you have to just keep watching because we will never be able to predict exactly when they are going to come back. Brent, sorry, what was the update that you got from around quarantine? I'm just on Gallagher shortcut now. And look at our crested Franklin nibbling away. Copy that, thanks. I'm going to take uh, Gallagher Pan and check around in Vubu Road just in case they've gone around the back there. Okay, the Franklin is lovely, it is beautiful. But we have things to find, and apparently the people at camp are reporting that the lions are calling much, much closer than we realized. Which is exciting news. Must be Connor who picked up on that. Connor and Jerry enjoying their morning in camp being serenaded by the lions. Okay. Sounds like a good way to enjoy a Monday morning. Okay, let us go and investigate. Whoopsie. Sorry, everybody. Bumpy, bumpy. This is the one thing about the Gallagher shortcut den, it's really tricky to navigate around, especially with a large sort of two meter, six foot antenna sticking up out of the back of your vehicle. There we go. And of course the beanie saga continues, but I'm not even going to say any more about that. Just excuse me every time I try and yank it back down over my ears. I have hopes, I have high hopes for this morning. So many exciting things happening. Judging by the amount of conversation that is happening on the Game Drive channel, many, many exciting things on the cards. All right, so while we race off to check one area where the lions were calling, let us find out how Brent is going to choose. Where is he going to go and check next? Decisions, decisions, lion or leopard? Uh, since the lions are making a noise, I think we're going to look for lions. We've got some lion tracks next to me here, but I think they're from yesterday. This is the area Steph was working on the sunset safari. So the mating pair could be around the corner, but I can hear some flapping wings. And well done to James Richard, who got the bird quiz correct. It was indeed a rattling cysticula. And in the large jackalberry, we've got quite a few different species. I can hear some grey go-away birds, but I also heard the sound of a 1980s computer, which means there are green pigeons in there somewhere as well. There they are. Bottom. There we go. Just, there we go. They have found it. There we go. The green pigeon. And to me, they always sound like those old Bond movies where the villain has the huge supercomputer that do -do 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 -do. a very, very distinct call. Now, the Afrikaans name for a green pigeon is, is, is a very descriptive one. It's called a papakai daif. And what that means is that a parrot dove. So it's the only member of the dove or pigeon family that has zygodactyl feet. So instead of having three toes forward and one back, it's got two toes forward and two back. And they are fruit eaters, so it enables them to clamber like a parrot, 
across the tree and of course at the moment the jackalberries are coming into fruit so they are literally uh, full of the fruit eaters and the two biggest fruit eaters we get are the green pigeons and of course the grey go away birds and the green pigeon being far prettier and far nicer to listen to than a grey go away bird of course they're being very quiet now so I said there's lion tracks all around here but they've been driven over so they're not fresh um, but hopefully they're going to be around the next corner and that's the wonderful thing about being on a live safari we can't script what's going to happen next so we're in the middle of the bush and the northern Saabi sands uh, which is part of the greater Kruger which is part of the well, what's, let me just remember now uh, the Greater Limpopo Transfrontier Park. So there's about 8 million acres of unfenced area where animals can roam free. So of course there are boundaries that we can't cross, but the animals are more than, more than welcome to meander where they please. As I said, those lion tracks are not fresh. They're elephant. The elephant tracks on top of the lion tracks as well, so not fresh. And this is also the last area the Karula's tracks went in, so we're doing a, a double check. Uh, morning, Michael! Michael, welcome on safari with us today. Uh, Michael would like to know, do we have fences around camp? And do we ever have, have we ever had lions in camp? Um, not since I've been at Safari Live, but in other places I've had lions in camp regularly. And speaking of lions... No, they're still being driven over these tracks, so... Oh, those look quite a bit better on, on your side there. Dave, you see the lion tracks? Okay. And so, Michael, uh, we do have an elephant fence around camp, and that's to keep Ellie's and basically just elephants out. And camp itself has got a fence to keep everything out. Now, shh, but don't tell Brian. Brian is a gardener, and he's on leave. And he planted a whole bunch of, if he, if Dave was already laughing, he planted a whole bunch of sunflowers. And he was very proud because they were about this big. And even one of them had a flower. And because of the drought, the bush bucket came into camp and literally <laughs> mowed them to this high. Um, and so, uh, we do, and the elephants actually pushed the fence open the other day. And... Uh, started ch literally smashed all the trees nearly pushed a tree down onto um, the camp and we spotted something up ahead ah there's some speak of the elephants um, and the lion tracks are still heading in that direction but there's some ellies there so let's go have a look at the elephants see where the lions went I think the lions went back up towards Treehouse, but oh, lots and lots of elephants around at the moment. I've never seen elephants in the Sabi Sands like I have this year. I hit my record. I must have seen about 300 in a day, um, and that was. But I had to drive in the morning, then I had to go to a rangers meeting in the middle of the day, and it was down at in Coral. Oh, hello. We've got Ellie's on top of Termite Mound. I'm quite keen to catch up with Benjamin Button. Hopefully this is his herd. Now, for those of you not sure who Benji is, Benjamin Button is a little elephant calf. It looks way older than he is. He's got big wrinkles all over his forehead. Hello. Lots of bellies. They're incredible animals. Here we go. Yes. Hello. Giving us a good sniff. Coming to a bit closer to inspect. No, it's after the tree. So you can see the front of our vehicle there. That elephant's probably about four feet from the front of our car and literally taking no notice of us. Now, it's really fascinating. I think just before I, I, I left, we counted how many species a single elephant bull ate in about 20 minutes that we were with it. 
and it ate nine different plant species in that time. And you're going to find the elephants are eating a lot of plant species that if it had been a normal year, they wouldn't eat. So they're feeding a lot of spike thorns, terminalias, uh, and even monkey orange, which is something, if there had been more rain, they wouldn't actually focus on. Oh, there's a, there's a big cow coming through. Here we go. Hello, madam. Oh, I think it's a young boy, actually. He's only got one tusk. So, since we've already done a bird quiz, and even though I was only gone for four days, it feels like I was gone for two weeks, and I think you guys really need to be tested. So, who can tell me what tree is that elephant feeding on? And bonus points if you can get the scientific name. Uh, what tree is that elephant feeding on at the moment? And remember, answers through to questions at wildearth.tv or hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. What is the elephant's breakfast? There's something wonderful about just sitting quietly with a herd of elephants. Oh, big cow behind, about to come into frame. There we go. She's also only got one tusk. Oh, we can hear them. They're talking. Hello, mister. Dave, did you shower this morning? I think the elephant's smelling you. No. You did shower? Mm -hmm. Oh, you didn't shower, that's why. Did you I did, actually, yes. Oh, there we go. Tusk in the bum. Move out of the way, I'm bigger than you. Now, I know a lot of people get very worried about the drought and what happens to the animals, but drought is natural, as is flood out here. And in the long run, the fact the elephants are feeding off all these different species, it's going to cause bigger open areas that will hopefully stimulate grass growth, which will increase our grazer numbers. So it's good for the zebras and good for the wildebeest. Um, even though quite a lot of them might die this year, um, the genetic stock that's left is the sort of cream of the crop. And if we get good rains, and uh, with all the trees being pushed over and removed, it adds a little spot in the sun for the grass species to grow. And the, the better grass you have, oh, she doesn't look happy with that young bull. Now, elephant behavior is always a very interesting thing. And you can just see there's a slight stiffness, and it's not because of us. It's because of that young bull there. And she might have a little bit of misplaced head shaking at us, but we haven't annoyed her. It's, it's the young bull. You can see, even though it doesn't really look like she's upset, there's just a slight stiffness to her walk. She's just not 100% comfortable with that young bull. Now we're just going to move forward slightly to answer my budgie. And a huge safari dive welcome to my budgie, who's a new viewer. Now, my budgie is asking, why do elephants only have one tusk? Well, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we've only been looking at two elephants that have one tusk, but he has one with two tusks. So normally they have two tusks. If they have one tusk, um, they've generally broken it while feeding or fighting. Uh, or fighting in the male's case, and in the female's case, feeding. And there we go. Normally they have two tusks, and then you can see that little one has got two tusks. Now, this particular individual is feeding off an acacia. 
and it's got masses of hooked thorns. And if we had to grab any of those branches like that elephant's grabbing, our hands would absolutely be ripped to pieces. Now, the best way I can describe the inside of an elephant's mouth is it's like an old, tough piece of leather, like a boot. And you can see, happily munching on the thorns with little effect. So we've got a couple of answers for the tree that the elephant was feeding on, which is next to us now. Um, oh wait, we've got someone charging in as well. Hello. Oh, lion's roaring. Okay. I don't know if you guys heard that. It was a bit in the distance. Um, I'd say around Buffalo Dam, but possibly to the north. I'm just going to call on the radio quickly. And Gala Audio sounds to the north of Buffalzook Dam. Okay. So we had a couple of answers to the tree quiz. And uh, I think I've finally caught some of you out because so far no correct answers. So there it is. So we've got one person who says it's a red bush willow. You in the right family, wrong tree. And someone who says it's a monkey orange. And unfortunately, it's definitely not a monkey orange. I'll try to show you a monkey orange a bit later. It is a bush willow. So it's part of the Combretum family, but it is not a red bush willow. So there we go. I've given you a hint. So Joey, you are in the right family wrong individual species so keep guessing so we're going to leave these ellies now i want to just double check up ahead where the lion tracks go i just heard lions but they sounded like they're out of our traverse area but i'm pretty sure that mating pair should still be around and their tracks are still here Good morning, Felicity. Another viewer from the land of the long white cloud, New Zealand. And Felicity would like to know, are there any nerves in the tusks? Do they, do they hurt when they break? So very much, it is a tooth. It's, a, it's actually a, a, a modified, um, not a canine, incisor. And they do have a complicated nerve system. So we only see about, a, there's about two quarters of a tusk that's inside. And inside that, is a very large nerve so if it breaks deep it does hurt and they can damage the nerve and they can actually get abscesses and and, and um and they can go septic um but from both of those animals and sometimes elephants are born with one tusk or with no tusks uh, so unless it's a break that's visible it's very difficult for us to tell and we've still got the lion tracks heading north so i'm going to keep on these for now i'm just going to call them in and Gonzo for Wanuna Wansat Tingala, um, heading northwest on Twin Dams uh, towards uh, Spaghetti Junction, Chelepan. Okay, so we've still got the tracks there. And uh, as most of you know, I normally have tea in my. Oh, very interesting. Jamie's have got tracks up ahead, but they're going southwest towards Zoe's Road. So it might be the same animals, but uh, we did get an, uh, uh, an update from the guys on Arethusa that they heard lions calling around in pile of planes. So I think we're going to stick on these tracks for now. And if we have no luck, then we'll head in that direction. But these tracks are going now more to the, the northeast towards Buffalo's Hook uh, Dam, where we heard that where I heard those lions calling a bit earlier, and I'm hoping they haven't managed to just keep going straight through and out of our traverse zone. Uh, Felicity. Ah. Oh! Now you guys are guessing. I said it was part of the bush willow family, so it's definitely not a terminalia. 
Well, I think I need to get... See, I've only been away for four days and, and, and you guys are getting lax on your quizzes. Come on, you guys know this tree. Okay, I don't... Uh, lion tracks are still here. So, as we're saying, Felicity, yes, there are massive nerves um, in, inside an elephant tusk and, and it can hurt when they break if they break it deep. But uh, it doesn't look like those two are any pain. There's no abscesses either. Um, we are going to go across to Jamie for an update. But before we do that, it's time for another bird quiz. You got him there, Dev? Oh, he flew. Okay, well, we're going to have to uh, do a bird quiz a bit later. That bird disappeared. Uh, so while we keep on these lion tracks, uh, let's go see how Jamie's doing on her lion tracks. Oh, interesting uh, times lie ahead for us. I know that Brent was giving you my update about the tracks that I found before his bird then fell, flew away. Interesting stuff because we've got tracks for Shamer. I, I didn't realize he had lion tracks and not leopard tracks. I thought he had leopard tracks. He's got lion tracks. I've got leopard tracks, really fresh leopard tracks. And I'm going to tell you about them in a moment. But first, let's wait for the zebra to come through in front of us. Awesome. There is such a tiny little foal wandering through. Come on. little bit nervous on this windy morning. Here comes the little foal. It's going to... Oh, no, it's stopped. It's got nervous. It's <laughs> behind the rest of the family. Here it comes. It's coming here. You'll see it coming out here. Here we go. Hello, little one. I love zebra foals. They are so fluffy. <laughs> Cute to look at. And they grow so incredibly quickly. Oh, through the dip. Better catch up with Mom. Mom's already gone. Now, one thing that we were incredibly, I say we, James and the viewers. Run, little one, Mommy's there. We're incredibly privileged to witness was a live zebra birth out on quarantine. And who knows, this could actually be that foal. Although I think it's a little bit too young for that. It's something that I wish we could have followed up on. We were never able to, but imagine that, a live zebra fall birth. And here come the rest at quite the pace, actually. Oh, no. slowing down for the dip. Racing across the open area. I wonder if something's got them a little bit nervous. I'm not even going to make the zebra crossing joke. You can all make it in your own minds. Ha ha ha. Awesome. Now, I don't want to delay for too long because I suspect that those alarm calls that we started off our morning talking about were in response to a leopard. Now, it's, what is interesting about those tracks that we found, it's one big set of male tracks, either Vula or Tingana sized, one of the older leopards. And then there's a smaller set that is almost, almost the size of a big female. Here comes the straggler. But behind all of the others... And now there's angry elephants trumpeting in that direction. It's interesting. Sorry, I know our zebra are really lovely, but I am distracted by what we found. Two sets of leopard tracks, really, really crisp, fresh, beautiful tracks. One coming in this direction, about the size of Sindile's tracks. Can we guarantee that it's him? No. Do I think it's him? Yes, I really, really do. But what was interesting was the presence of the other older male's tracks. 
Now, Mvula is currently the leopard that they are sitting with just to the north of our boundary on Tamburti Dam. And I wonder whether those two haven't been following each other around and encountering each other since we last saw them sharing a kill. I don't know which way around it works. When I spoke to Kheri, he even suggested that Mvula might decide to follow Sindile. And I mean, this is just we. This is such a an unprecedented scenario with Sindile that we don't know exactly how things are going to play out. But he suggested Mvula might actually follow Sindile, kind of start to share his kills on a more regular basis, or vice versa. Now, Sindile's tracks split off this way. The older set of male tracks, I don't know exactly where they went. I don't think they've crossed out. But Vula might have turned around and gone back north. Speculation, I know. But let's go and investigate because those alarm calls came from the direction that his, tra his tracks are heading in. And they are... It's very soft sand around the Galago Pan. But they're beautifully fresh. You can see each and every crisp outline. And that's why I want to put a little bit of haste to my journey. So much for my plan this morning, which was to go straight to Bufflesuk Dam. Clearly that's worked out very well. As is my hat right now. Oh, speaking of Sindile, of course we then start to wonder about his mother Shadow and her little cub. That James is nicknamed Zara, but not in brackets, not the official name. Um, and Michael Fleetwood, you were wondering what the latest update on Shadow is. Well, we went racing forward into Arethusa. When was it, Chandra? Was it two days ago? Well, it was two days ago. Two days ago, on a report that Shadow was on a kill. Unfortunately, she had lost the kill to a hyena, but apparently the cub and her were safe and sound. We never figured out exactly where they went, which is a bit disappointing, but just one of those things. We never figured out where they went. But we know that she is, or at least as of two days ago, alive and well, well fed. Apparently she managed to eat a lot of that kill before she moved off, or before the hyena chased her off. But she is alive and well, as is her little cub. I know that Steph touched on it yesterday, but it's so interesting the way that Sindile keeps... The, the way that he's moved since he's been released back into the Sabi sand, the fact that he hiked all the way into Kruger to Skukuza and then moved all the way back into his natal range. So the place where he grew up. It's a, such a fascinating, I don't know, behavioral study I guess is the way to describe it. I'm uh, moving quite quickly. I want to just check this two track. The other thing I've noticed about Sindile, but it's dangerous, it's a very very dangerous assumption to make. I mean, not, not that dangerous, but he seems to walk the same paths. He seems to walk the same roads. He always follows this route across the western end of quarantine and then through the drainage system along here. I say always, he's done it about four times. But that's still, I mean, leopards, leopards do become creatures of habit, except for Karula, to whom none of the rules will ever apply. Just speed up a little bit. Cover a bit more ground. And check at the same time that I haven't missed his tracks coming across, but I don't I think he's cut south towards Rebecca's Road. There is also a chance, by the way, to build up a little bit of excitement that Mvula might decide to get up and come south. He is very close to our boundary. I'm hoping that he might decide to do that. There is a river system that leopards love to move through in this area that runs all along the edge of quarantine and provides a really pleasant, sort of basically a hiding hole, but also a highway for them to move through. 
and he probably you'll probably find that he walked along here there's just a number of escape routes for a leopard there's a number of hiding spots and they can walk through undetected which is one of the big reasons why we always always check the river systems or what we call the drainage lines in the area like this particular one pops out at Philemon's dip which is where Aubrey said he heard those alarm calls I have lost the tracks by the way I'm no longer on them they're coming this in this direction and there's a road that will we should pick them if he's moved through that block we should pick up on them as we go along it Otherwise, all is very, very quiet. You see what that is, John Doe? Old hyena. Okay, cool. I was just asking John Doe, since he can lean over that side of the vehicle, makes life a bit easier. It doesn't help being short, because you can't see over the front of the Land Rover. Exciting, exciting news. If we don't have any success here, we're going to be doing a very rapid race towards Cheetah Plains. But I'll explain that to you if we, depending upon what happens. Uh, copy that, Andrew. Confirm those Ngala visible from the boundary. Copy that. Awesome. Thanks, Andrew. I just want to double check Rebecca's road and then I'm going to head across there. Hey, I've got an exciting thing happening around Cheetah Plains. And I think, actually, oh, I don't know what to do now. There's too many things. There's so many things to choose between. I think we're going to hold off on our trip to Cheetah Plains for now. I just want to check Rebecca's road and see whether there's any sign of these leopard tracks popping out. I've driven this road twice now and Brent has as well so I'm not too bothered about speeding past. And then hopefully we'll finish off a well, hopefully Mvula will decide to come a little bit further to the south. So we've got leopards everywhere. Karula's still somewhere here, I'm sure. We just have to find them. Jandre has just picked up on tracks along the road. It's a civet track. <laughs> uh, moving on swiftly. Cat, uh, yes, Karula will absolutely want to move her cubs away from all of these males wandering about. Now, Mvula, she might be okay with. She has mated with Mvula, so she might, but still, I don't think, I think Karula's, one of the keys to Karula's success in terms of cub raising is that she really doesn't take any chances. And what it seems that she, what, from what we can tell from the tracks, what it seems like what she does is she takes the cubs away, leaves them somewhere and then goes and actually physically intercepts the male. We don't know this for certain but this is what the tracks indicate. She'll take the cubs away and then she'll go and she'll almost pull the male away from her cubs and towards a safe towards a safe distance away from them. Now Sundile, as lovely as he is, is an enormous threat to Karula's cubs. So it 
could well be. You're absolutely right, Kat. She may well have decided to move her cubs a little bit further to the south. But then she might not know that he's here. He's not calling. He's certainly not scent marking. He's far too young for that. He is basically playing a game of be as secretive and subtle as possible. And at the same time, I think he's going to go straight back to where Shadow is. Somewhere on Arethusa or Hoffman's, I think he's going to go and try and find her again. I don't think he's quite given up on the idea of being accepted by Mom again. Which, of course, is never going to happen. Because she, her attentions are thoroughly being lavished upon her new, new cubs. Oh, well, Jandre is forgiven because I just pulled over for white-tailed mongoose track. So we shall forgive Jandre, his er the error of his ways, and while we concentrate both of us on tracking the right animal, let's send you back across to Brent, find out how his morning's going. So we've followed those tracks from where Steph had the lines yesterday all the way to Buffelsook Dam. Uh, I lost them just before Buffelsook Dam. I'm trying to get a direction at the moment. And even since I've been gone, the water's just disappearing. And I don't even think old Bob the Bachelor Hippo's got a spot anymore. But I'm just trying to see where these lines went. Um, I just want to check on the soft sand up there. The line audio we heard earlier was in this area, but I, I unfortunately have the sneaking suspicion that it was north of our, our boundary. Here we go. Let's have a look here. Okay, so there's no line tracks on this side. Oh, there are. Ooh, that's interesting. Now, I know I've been away for a few days, and it seems like that female might have moved her cubs from the den um, that we had just above here and these female tracks are going down towards the drainage system here and I'm definitely not feeling brave enough to go play with the lioness now these tracks coming in and out and they're only female tracks here so there's a very strong possibility in this little river system below Buffalo's Hook that she's put the cubs there but we're gonna go check the den first um, there were a lot of Ellie's there, so she might have moved them. Uh, but I'm, and I'm I'm quite surprised she hasn't moved that den earlier. It could be because with the lion densities we've had on Juma at the moment, and the hyena den moving into the Manuleti, that she feels quite confident that she doesn't have a threat uh, she, from other lions at the moment because the, the Birmingham boys are, are seriously dominant, uh, and the fact that the hyena den has moved further to, further to the north that it's probably okay to leave them in one place. I think if, if the hyenas had been on Juma, she probably would have moved that den multiple times. So those tracks are coming. The, the cubs could still be there. Let's go have a look. So the tracks of the mating pair, I think, have gone along uh, Buffalo's Hook East rather than West. We're on Buffalo's Hook West at the moment, or they've gone towards Gwari Pan. So we're going to check the den. If we get nothing at the den, we're going to head around to Cheetah Cut Line, uh, and I also just want to check the northern boundary in case they've just shot straight across. Because I think that lion I heard roaring was definitely in Buffalo's Hook, or if not, right on the boundary in this area. And as I was saying earlier, most of you know I like my Earl Grey tea in the morning. But uh, I've just come back from Rwanda, and Rwanda's got incredible coffee in. And this is a particular particularly nice bend that says uh, it has hints of bourbon and dark chocolate and it does very very delicious coffee mmm yum so and uh, here is Joe you got that tree correct it was indeed a variable bush willow and no one got the bonus points for the scientific name. It's Combretum calinum. And uh, if we look at a red bush willow, which is this one here, you can see the leaves are much, much smaller. That's actually not a good red bush willow leaf. Let me find a better one. And they're all curling at the moment, dropping off the trees. Uh, uh, there we go. 
and a red bush willow is Combretum apiculatum and the best way to remember is that on the edge there's a little pick so a little sharp point on the edge of the red bush willow also the leaves are much much smaller than the other bush willow species now uh, Zahiri, which is the large fruited bush willow, which some of you thought it is, um, the shape of the tree is a bit different. Uh, the variable bush willow can be very confusing because it's got sometimes it's got big leaves, sometimes it's got medium sized leaves. It all depends on what type of soil it's growing in. So uh, I would say we don't have that many large fruited bush willows here. We have a lot more calinums and even the fruit, the variable bush willow, hence the name variable, it's, it's got lots of different shapes, sizes. Uh, but generally a little bit smaller than the large large fruited the large fruit has also got very big leaves and it's more sort of a, a clump uh, rather than a, a standalone tree but again it can be very confusing with with the trees and uh, it all depends on the area that they're in quite often how much water they have access to what soil types they're in and that can dictate how they grow okay so we multiple checking we're checking if that mating pair of lions has not left our tribos area we're also going to go check the the lion den to see if those little delectable monsters are still there Ooh. jamie's found leopard tracks isn't that exciting but we're gonna you're gonna hang with me while we go check for that in Kuruma lioness. Fingers crossed she's still there. And as I said, she chose such a good den site. Uh, and when it comes to cats choosing den sites, it's not only the inaccessibility uh, of them, it's, it's also very good that it's not on any major elephant paths or near roads because other predators like hyenas often will use roads etc to to march and patrol so if she's she's far enough off the main roads and uh, n n along no major elephant paths that a leopard or a hyena or a nomadic male lion might use okay we're about to arrive oh i realized as I went past that tree, all my lights are still on me. It's a bit light for lights. Now, it's possibly, these little lion cubs are possibly the only thing cuter than Dangerous Dave we have out here. Dave is chuckling and, 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 and I think we might have to put him on camera a little later. Mm. <laughs> okay. Let's have a look. Are they in the drainage line or are they still in that thicket? But as I said, I think it's quite possible she's moved the den because she has been here for nearly two weeks. Okay, so we're just going to listen. And sometimes it's quite difficult to find them. I mean, they're, they're generally right in that little thicket and you just pick up the tiniest bit of movement. You can actually see where the lioness has been feeding them, how she's completely flat in that area. I don't think they're here anymore. I think she's moved them to the, the west of Buffalo Dam. Well, there we go. So I think she's moved the den site. Um, there's no sign of them in the drainage line. So. We're going to have to find the next den site. Oh, hi, Mike. Uh, Michael says, is it safe to assume that that mating lioness has lost her cubs? Because when we first saw her mating, she had very visible suckle marks. Um, and the fact that she's literally been mating for, I think it's five or six days now with two different males. I think, Michael, yes, it is safe to assume she's lost those cubs. So what killed them is a very, hmm, no, that's a very interesting. This is a male lion track here. And I think this could have been the mating pair. We're going to check up on the boundary now. 
Uh, but yes, Michael, I think it is safe to assume that she's lost those cubs. Um, and uh, as very sa as sad as it is, it is it is a very common occurrence out in the wild. And lion and leopard cubs have, for their first year, about a 70% mortality in the Sabi Sands. And normally, uh, from known deaths, uh, the deaths are due to not hyenas and not other predators, but it's normally uh, males of the same species, uh, nomadic males, uh, and even in some cases with lions that uh, the dominant coalition will eat their own cubs occasionally. And uh, I'm hoping that didn't happen, but we don't know. And, and all we can do is, is guess and speculate about what possibly happened to those cubs. But I think it's very safe to assume that she's lost those cubs. Uh, when we first saw her mating, there was a possibility, and it happens sometimes with lions, that because she's just given birth, she's got high estrogen levels, and those estrogen levels confuse the males to thinking that she's ready for mating, and, and quite often they will, they will just mate to placate the males. But the fact that it's gone on for so long and she's swapped males, I think it is, it is safe to assume she has lost those cubs. Um, those are the only set of Nkuma cubs we didn't see. So... As I said, it's very difficult for us to know what, exactly what happened. So we're now going to check along the northern edge of our traverse area, seeing if that mating pair didn't cross into Buffalo's Hook. And fingers crossed they didn't. Have some more coffee. So while we keep checking for these lions, fresh track of a leopard. So let's go see how her tracking is going. Day morning crossword puzzle. I think that's how Brent describes it and I think it was a brilliant description. We were out first thing in the morning and trying to puzzle out the clues. It's like doing a cryptic crossword designed by someone with a very tricky mind. Because Sundelia's tracks did not come out on the road, however somebody else's tracks did. And it's either shadow, well, it's a female leopard. See the shadow or Karula, and it's in this area, it's most likely shadow. So the plot seriously thickens, and yet now I have to choose between trying to figure out whether to race to Cheetah Plains to show you that surprise, or trying to find shadow somewhere in here. It's a very tricky one. I'll, I want to show you the tracks, but I'm going to have to try and find a spot, a suitable spot to show you them. Now just bear with me while I try and search for a nice track example. She's gone off in here. And I said to Jandre as we came around the corner, one day I'm going to come around and there's going to be a leopard in this Balanites. One day it is going to happen. There's no leopard there, is there? No got so excited. I always get excited. Oh! Wonderful news! Aubrey's here! Fantastic! I can show him the tracks at the same time. Yay! <coughs> Our Orb's last tracks are just in front of me. It looks like she might have gone west into this block, but I'll point out the last one for you. These tracks. Some nitwit dro drove over them, and that of course being me. Can't show you these ones for good reason. I'll just wait a moment. They're so fresh, they're on top of another animal's tracks. There we go. I can show you these ones. Now I have to try and figure out how to show you these ones on this tricky slope. They are beautifully, beautifully fresh. Oh, can you get those ones there, Jandre? Whew, that was a tricky spot. Let me just hop out and show you exactly which tracks it is that I am looking at. Because a leopard track can be very confusing if you're seeing it for the first time. 
No, it just didn't... Oh, hold on. Are these actually his? Confusion now. These, these tracks look bigger in the soft side. Just sorry, just hold on one moment. They look smaller in soft sand. I don't know. I'm getting very confused with Cindile's tracks because they're so, so close to the size of an... No, 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 this is female. Definitely female. Okay, I feel better about my life now. <laughs> Brief moment of confusion. These ones are nicer. Here comes Aubrey along to have a look as well. Now, these are the nicest set of tracks, and we're looking here. There's a lobe of the back of the foot. This is the back pad, tracing it out. Here's the toes. And here is the back foot of this particular leopard, complete with toes. Uh, with all animals, most, most of the mammals out here. How's it, Aubrey? Hi, guys. Hi. I've gone in that way. Sorry. Let me just, uh, one, one second, and then I'm done. All right, so front foot bigger and rounder, whereas the back foot is always smaller and slightly more elongated. It's sort of an oval as opposed to a round shape. You can see the difference there. The speed, sort of normal walking speed that this leopard was doing. I've got, I can't just move out of the way now. <laughs> Morning, everybody. Luckily, my hat doesn't look ridiculous at all for our audience. I can't find my earpiece. It's gone. It's gone. Oh well. I have to I have to do drive without comms. Got it. This is now turning into an embarrassing spectacle. My beanie's going further and further up my head. No, John Dre. And I'm covered in grey paint that won't come off my fingernails. And I've got an audience that are looking thoroughly bemused. Uh, just shuffle away out of everybody's way. Do you think it's do you think it's shadow or do you think it's yeah yeah? Go around Trimple Okay, awesome. Will you let me know if it crosses there? Okay. Thanks. Cheers, guys. Bye. Have fun. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. Right, now that we've made an ex not an embarrassment of ourselves, I just got a bit, I just felt a little bit awkward there with them all watching as we did that track demonstration. Aubrey's going to go and check round, oh goodness, now Rusty won't go into reverse. There we go. Lovely, lovely, fresh leopard tracks. And at least I know that they agree with me that they think it is Shadow. So that was Aubrey. We also have a viewer called Aubrey. We probably have, maybe even have two viewers called Aubrey. But Aubrey is one of the guides at Galago, Vuertilla, one of the guest lodges that you can stay at here. And his tracker Will, William. So Shadow has come out of nowhere, apparently. It feels as though she just dropped out of the sky because there's no tracks on this road. I want to just do a loop around here and just double check that she hasn't got, she hasn't come back towards where she might have left her cub. So there we go, we were asking for an update on Shadow. She's here, she's on Juma, and I have to tell you that I was expecting that because when I was on Arethusa yesterday, we had Saleeshe, the female leopard that has been pushing more and more into shadows territory and as a result she's going to encroach more on Karula's territory because she's smack bang in the middle of those two leopards and Karula's her mother and Saleeshe is not directly related to her she's also much bigger than shadow is and I think she's just going to slowly push in this way especially with Shad with Saleeshe's daughter slowly getting to the point of being independent so interesting changes in our leopard dynamics our females seem to be doing what happened with our males a year ago when the Anderson males started pushing Tingana west. No, east, opposite direction. It's exactly the same movement, just with the females instead of the males. 
and a year later. It seems as though Brent has decided he's going to go for a walk. I'm sure he is hot on the trail of something very exciting. I don't know what it may be. I've got some of his Rwandan coffee that I'm now going to try. That is delicious. He was right. Truly delicious. And very hot and slightly crunchy. I'm pretty sure coffee shouldn't crunch. Oh well. Okay, the shadow didn't come from where I expected her to come from, but she might have just done her thing walking in this enormous, very, very difficult patch of vegetation. We're going to leave her. I'm going to make a judgment call here, and we're going to leave her because the surprise at Cheetah Plains is worth it. But with, I don't think I would have left if Aubrey hadn't been there, but Aubrey's going to follow up, which means that we've still got a chance of seeing her. But I have to choose. I have to make a choice and I'm going to make the choice to go to Cheetah Plains. And when I get there and when you see what we're going to see, then you'll understand why I made that decision. So don't hate me too much. I also think that it's going to be very tricky to find Shadow in this block. We don't have, we don't have any guarantee of seeing her, but there is a guaranteed something on Cheetah Plains. So we're going that way. My mind is made up. I've been struggling with the decision the whole time. And that is where we're going to go. Uh, while I put foot to floor to get us to Cheetah Plains in time to go and see the special thing, and send you back to Brent to find out where he went wandering to. How exciting! I didn't mean I don't even know what Jamie's rushing to go see at Cheetah Plains. So I'm going to slowly make my way towards the shadow tracks and as we know over the last while shadow has actually been a very difficult leopard to track and I think that's because Cindile has been around so she's been trying to avoid him and in avoiding him she avoids us so hopefully we have a little bit of luck with shadow who's actually having a bit of a hard time at the moment uh, Saleh Hesh is now starting to move further to the east and pushing shadow deeper into Karula's territory and that is not something you see out on Cheetah Cutline very often um, but it could be because of the drought. Now, of course, normally that bird is a huge fan of fish, being an African fish eagle. But they will hunt squirrels and other things if there's no fish about. Here we go. And quite nice. I think this is the first fish eagle I've seen in many months. And since the dam started drying up and all the catfish are dead, now this is definitely the first fish eagle I've seen off Arethusa. Um, in the last five or six months. Oh, there he goes. The African fish eagle. One. Oh. Maybe it's up hunting squirrels. There he goes. Could be heading towards the Chitwa Chitwa Dam, which is one of the only major water holes left in the northern Sabi Sands, uh, well in, in this section at least. Um, there's a couple in Buffles Hook and there's one other south of Arethusa called, strangely enough, Big Dam. Very, 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 very creative naming of a waterhole there. Um, but that is outside of our travel zone. As we know, the Arethusa waterhole is nearly completely dry and it's only the really the pumped waterholes, Red Dam, Galago, uh, Vuyatela, and Buffles Hook, I think, is going to be dry within the next month. So, it is making life a little bit easier for us as it does force those animals to those permanent water points. Dave, do you remember this spot? Oh, yes. This is where Dave and I had the longest ever honey badger sighting in wild earth history, and it was on foot. And then we tracked a serval, which we didn't find, but we did manage to track a serval for over a kilometer. Until uh, it went into some rocky, rocky ground near one of the drainage lines there. Now this is a, this is good honey badger territory around Cheetah Cutline. I've um, seen them quite a few times here. It was actually right here where we saw those honey badgers. 
just beyond, we snuck up to the termite mound and viewed them feeding about 20 meters from us, digging up what looked to be dung beetle larvae. Oh, I'm going to have to have a morning meeting shortly. Well, hello, James from Springs. James is wondering about Pete's Pond, which is one of our waterhole cameras, and whether it's in Juma. It's not. It's not even in South Africa. It's in Mashatu in Botswana. Hello, hello, Andrew. Hello, how are you? Very well. How are you this morning? Good, thanks, man. You know, there's a dragon on your on your neck. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, just yeah, just yeah, checking. Man. I'm trying to get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> morning, everyone. Yeah, nice teacher. Okay. Who's gonna come along? Ah, uh, Jamie's fun, but. Uh, they don't know what Jamie's fun before. No, okay. <laughs> Cheers, Andrew. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Enjoy. Andrew nearly gave away what Jamie's rushing to. I'm hopefully you guys didn't hear that. Uh, or did you? But Jamie is making haste towards the east to the plains of the cheetah. And uh, hopefully there's some big cat surprise for you on in the eastern sectors. We're going to go, as I said, go try and find that leopard. I think all the lions have disappeared. And fortunately, uh, and, um, it happened while I was away, but I'm sure most of you know, uh, an adult elephant, unfortunately ex for the elephant, expired in Buffalo's Hook, which literally means every single lion in the northern Sabi Sands is feasting upon an elephant. And unfortunately, that is out of our traverse area. Very rude of the elephant to die out of our traverse area. If they're going to die, we'd prefer them to die where we are. Uh, but we don't want elephants to die, of course. And remember, we're on a live African safari. And very interesting now, we're talking about dead elephants. And Terry Steele is wondering what happens to the tusks and are they protected from the ivory market? Well, at the moment, Terry, the ivory is still in the elephants, in the elephant, and uh, it would be highly ill-advised to remove it while there are um, sort of nine lions around it and as uh, soon as the lions move off uh, the tusk will be removed handed into the sabi sands and they will go into a vault so yes they are protected from the illegal ivory market and that elephant was not poached so don't worry about that it died of natural causes and we're probably going to find a few more uh, elephants and, and buffalo and hippo in particular are, are, are three of the, the major large species that are going to die during this drought. We've already started to see some signs on the kudu and the warthog and strangely enough warthog are the first to show uh, sort of skin and bones uh, in, a, in a drought. Warthog and buffalo and we've noticed in all the big herds of buffalo we've been seeing over the last month or two very few little babies. So it's the old and the young that suffer the most and now, I know it's very difficult for a lot of people, but the last major drought we had in this area, uh, a very similar drought caused by El Nino, was in 1992-93. And at that stage, the Kruger, the Greater Kruger, which we are part of, had uh, 30,000 buffalo, and they dropped to 12,000 buffalo during that time. But in the space between then and now, the buffalo population has gone up to 50,000. So the genetics of the buffalo that survived the last drought produced really really impressive buffalo that managed to breed very fast and, and bring back those numbers so it's unlikely that we're going to because of the buffalo population we're not going to drop as many as we did in 92 93 but also if we get good rains with the elephants clearing out a lot of the areas you're going to have lots of space for your your decreaser grass species your panicum your thermida the grass that the the, bra uh, the grazers really really like so you'll find that population will bounce back very very quickly now with the elephants uh, elephant populations control themselves. So let's take northern Botswana, for example, which is the largest free roaming population of elephants in the world. It's estimated anything from 150 to 250,000 elephants. And uh, every year, four or five thousand elephants die. And, and it's natural. And then in a drought year, you might get 10,000 elephants that die. But we, you can't look at the individual and, and, and I know it's very difficult as, as people not to look at the individual because if you look at the wider scheme of things uh, even in a, in a population like South Africa uh, where we've in the greater Kruger we've got about 17,000 uh, to 20,000 estimated elephants if 5,000 die it actually doesn't affect the, the meta population 
Well, there's Jamie speeding past us. And of course, you'll notice Jamie's got a third person on the back. And that is, I'm actually going to leave it as a surprise who the third person is the back. You'll I'm find out. Off, 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 move, move, move. So, Jamie has some rubber to burn. Uh, we are, of course, going to continue at a far more sedate pace because we're not burning rubber. We're going to go try and track a leopard. 